Nasty. Just kidding. You're up. No, you don't. <laughs> no, you don't. Not at this place. All right, I'll get started. So uh, a little bit myself first, just so you know, uh, a couple of places of where I'm coming from. Like you said, I'm Dr. Trevor Wilkins. Uh, I work as a psychotherapist. I have an office in Kentucky, but I also have an online program statewide or nationwide rather. And what I specialize in is complex PTSD, high risk careers, type A personalities, anger, anxiety, the things that, uh, that tend to go with the people that we follow, the law enforcement and military community that many of us are a part of. I spent 15 years in uniform law enforcement, 18 years in public service as an EMT before that. So three years before and the 15 years uniform law enforcement, mostly with the Lexington, Kentucky police, an agency of about 600 people and then the Kentucky State Police for most of my career. Um, last time I spoke, the last two times, I talked about the demise of that career. Uh, it ended before I want to. You could do math, 15 is not 20. It ended before I wanted it to. Um, and we could talk about that, you know, if questions arise or it becomes uh, appropriate, but I've talked about that the last two times. And I talked about that the last two times because what I talked about specifically was more of that complex trauma. Now that's certainly something that people in the room have dealt with. I've treated people in the room before um, and it's important, but we're gonna go a little bit different direction because what I've learned over the last 10 years of doing this job now as being a doctor of psychotherapy and working in this one-on-one -on -one setting, working with groups and giving a lot of these presentations across the nation, both to military, public safety and counseling groups is that it's not all trauma. Now we all have trauma. Trauma to me is defined as something that your brain doesn't know what to do with. So that could be age three or five or eight or 10 or 12. It could be the big T trauma, the stuff we think about like 9-11, car crashes, combat. It could also be what I call little T trauma, which is adverse life events. Parents divorced, dad left, nobody took care of us, we were neglected, we were bullied when we were young. That stuff adds up too. So to put a label on trauma is a little bit difficult because everybody's got some of it and that's okay, it's a fixable problem. But what I found was when I was being force fed this trauma idea when I first got started is that it's not everything. There's a lot of other things that we go through on a daily basis that may not be affected by that trauma. And again, if you look at, you know, the last couple of years of presentations, I, spe so, I, I spoke specifically about PTSD and I'm going to kind of leave those there. We're going to go a little different direction today. Now, what I'll tell you is, and, and I kind of like to level the playing field a little bit, and I'll show you how I do that. I'll just tell you, uh, like probably most people feel in this room, I am not in any way qualified to teach this book to you. I'm not. Now I know that we like to say that none of us really are. I think sometimes people with doctor in front of their name aren't qualified to teach it, right? We've been to those churches, we've seen those people. I know people that have no letters behind their name that are probably far more qualified than somebody with doctor in front of their name to teach this book. But here's why I say I'm not qualified to teach this. And again, I know we all say that. I'm not looking for a response or uh, to be uplifted about that. I'm not qualified. None of us really are. Here's why I'm not qualified, and I want to tell you why I say this. I tend to lose my zitzis. I don't know when the last time I had four of them was. I got one on my backpack in the room to remind me to keep my head straight a little bit. When I do have four, I forget to wear them. Uh, you don't have to give me yours, because I'll probably lose them. <laughs> Uh, I appreciate it, but I'll probably lose them. I forget to wear them. Sometimes I eat stuff I'm not supposed to eat and I have to repent for that because I'm a knucklehead. Sometimes I check out hot girls in the gym because I'm a knucklehead. Now, I don't know if the, uh, I was having a conversation with somebody earlier tonight. I don't know if that amounts to lust, but I probably shouldn't be doing that anyway, right? Um, sometimes I'm not really sure what this book's trying to tell me. Sometimes I'm not really sure that the people that teach me about this book have got it figured out yet. Of course, they'll tell you they don't, unless they don't know. They don't know they don't know. But I'm not necessarily qualified to teach out of this book. We're not gonna spend a lot of time in it during this because I'm gonna move this a little towards mental health. But here's why I say those things, is what I'm telling you tonight is coming from somebody who's trying to figure it out too. I'm trying to figure out this thing. Uh, maybe I've learned a little bit more because of people like Bear, because of people that have taught Kosher Dad and people that I've been involved with over the last couple years, trying to do my own research and my own reading. So maybe I'm a little ahead of where I was before, 
but I'm still trying to figure this out too. And I know when we come to these things, it feels like there's a whole lot of spiritual giants in this room. And I think there are. There's lots of people in here I look up to. But I'm just going to tell you, it says doctor in front of my name. I ain't got it figured out. Right? This is coming from a place of I'm trying to figure it out too. Oh, well, thanks, brother. Good estate. Thanks. I'm trying to figure this out too. So I like to level the playing field a little bit that way. I don't have all the answers. I'm pretty good at therapy, I think. I've done a lot of work and research. I'm a lifetime learner. It's important to me to be really good at my job. There's nothing more embarrassing than having somebody sit across from me ask you a question and you don't have the answer. And I'm not going to say that never happens, but I've gotten a little bit better at it. Um, I'm a lifetime learner. So this is why I like to teach. I have to force myself to learn in order to teach. Katie talked about that just a little bit earlier, right? If you're going to teach it, you have to figure it out a little bit. At least make your way. So I'm still figuring this out. But one of the things that I've gotten pretty good at is talking about mental health. I talk about mental health because, long story short, that 15 years and getting fired from the state police left me in a pretty dark place. I was in a terrible hole. I won't go the whole story because it's kind of a long one. It's multiple years of being in this dark hole, but I lost my wife. My kids were scared of me. I lost my job. I watched my cruiser drive out of the driveway. I had no marketable skills whatsoever. Just before I left, they sent me to two therapists that said that they could help me. The first lady cried when I told her what I was going through. Not helpful. Uh, <laughs> The second guy told me that my trauma or my PTSD and my anger were so bad that he didn't know what to do with me or where to send me. So now here I am in a place of I finally was weak enough, in my opinion, turned out to be strong enough, and I'll talk about that, weak enough, in my opinion, to reach out for help, and it failed in my face. Not only was I not fixable, I wasn't fixable, right? Not only could I not fix myself, but they couldn't fix me either. Now, like most of the men in this room and, and why I like being in a room like this is because I'm kind of bullheaded or thick-skulled or overly driven or whatever my wife says it is these days. And I decided to go to school with no degree, go through a PhD and figure out how to deal with this. I, I solely went to fix myself, not any of you. Uh, I get to do that now, it's pretty cool. But I solely went to fix myself because apparently I was so screwed up that the doctors didn't know how to take care of me. So. That's that journey to get to the doctor title, to get to the private practice that I opened for the online program, for the continuing to learn through people like T, the people in this room. And we actually talked uh, first day, he and I did, uh, just kind of standing in the corner where we were sitting, looking in the room, and, and I don't remember which one of us said, like, man, it's nice to be in a room of men. <laughs> like, it's nice to be in a room of actual men, right, that we can talk about this stuff. My world is surrounded by counselors. They all wear toe-loop sandals and shawls, and they're all really weird and hug everybody, and they think everybody's a victim of something. So it's nice to be in a group where there's a bunch of men uh, that know that we're not all a victim of something. We've been a victim of something, but we don't stay a victim. So that's where this talk is going to go. Again, last time I talked about trauma, very specifically about trauma and how the brain works with trauma, and, and people always say that that works really well. But what I was getting to earlier was over the last 10 years, I figured out that it's just not trauma therapy that we need. Turns out we got to fix our stinking mindset. Now, mindset gets kind of a bad rap these days. When I hear mindset in the world, I think, oh, you're supposed to like take 10 deep breaths and walk away. And, you know, if you just think happy thoughts, like uh, uh, Kosher Dad hit it really good earlier today. You're, oh, it's Jesus, you're just supposed to be happy. Supposed to, that's how we know Jesus is in our heart. We're just supposed to be happy all the time. That's not mindset to me. Uh, it could be a far longer discussion about what that is. But it's not mindset to me. So mindset, which gets kind of this bad rap, it's not necessarily about uh, be, making yourself happy. It's about fixing the filter. And a lot of people have kind of heard that. Mindset's getting a little better reputation these days. It's fixing your filter. Trauma causes your filter to change. Life experiences cause your filter to change. Reading this book causes your filter to change. Listening to the YouTube channels that are in this room will cause your filter to change. It certainly helped me along the way. But we also fall short of that often too. What I mean by that is a lot of times, therapists are actually kind of good at helping you find the reason that you're upset. 
well, this goes back to when your mom didn't breastfeed you enough or your dad was abusive or you got bullied in school. And a lot of them are pretty good about getting to this point and making you go, oh yeah, man, that's where it all started, I guess, and that's where I got messed up from. I just got to forget that. And then they just leave you hanging there, right? Mm -hmm. Man, you had a terrible childhood. That's pretty tough. So it's not about finding the reason. It's not just about bringing awareness to where your mindset comes from. I have another problem with bringing awareness. One of the things I get to do is speak of a lot of law enforcement, military conferences. And I will admit we're doing better in those groups about talking about mental health. But I went to one in Nashville just a couple of months ago, and it was literally called the Wellness Symposium. Yeah. We're going to talk about mental health. This is cool. Cops need mental health, better mental health. This translates to military mental health. This would be great. I got to speak. Uh, I was very honored to speak. But I also attended a couple of uh, those groups. And every group that I went to, what they spoke about is that we need to bring awareness to mental health for public safety. No shit. I got that part, right? <laughs> Uh, it's important. Let's bring awareness to mental health for public safety and people that work high-risk jobs and people that have been victims of things or adults with childhood trauma. Absolutely, let's bring awareness to that. But the world today tends to stop there, right? That's why we victimize everybody and you're supposed to just accept everybody at their victim state. No says I, but that's okay. Uh, no says most of the people in this room, I think. We're all kind of like-minded. But it's just bringing awareness, right? Well, now what? That's cool. We brought awareness to it. So now what? We got to fix this stuff, man. We got to fix this filter. We got to fix this thing that keeps us down, depressed, anxiety, guilt, frustrated, annoyed, depressed, traumatized, complex traumatized. We got to fix this. So leaving kind of the trauma specifically itself aside, because there's different ways to treat that, that I've talked about the last couple of times and I get the honor of treating people. But this mindset we got to figure out where your mindset's coming from and fix that. Now, that sounds really complicated at first. Well, everybody's got a different childhood. Everybody's got a different upbringing. This is going to be really complicated to find the 70 different problems, the 70 different people in this room. And I know some people here are in a good place, and some people are hiding depression, and some people are hiding anxiety. You don't hide it from us, but you're hiding it, and you make on with your life, and you're hiding your difficult uh, marriage that you're having right now and you're hiding the <laughs> fact that your kids are out of control. We see it, uh, not to call you out on it, but we see it, but you're just hiding it. So everything's a little bit different. So how are we going to find the mindset problem of everybody in the room? Well, luckily, through years of research and trying to figure this out, I've kind of figured out they're all the same, actually. Whether it be the men in this room, whether it be our spouses, whether it be our kids, whether it be the guy that uh, directs traffic somewhere or the postman or the guy that works at a water treatment plant, we actually end up all the same. Let me tell you what that looks like. We all have different things in our life that make us a good dad, good husband, good person, good Christian, good follower, right? That's our rules, our morals, our laws, our beliefs, and everybody's are a little bit different. We share some in this room. But everybody's is a little bit different. And that's what I call your character. Your character is who you said you'd be, right? These are the things that you know damn good and well you're supposed to be doing to be a good person. There's things in this book that tell you that. There's things in society that tell you that, that you agree with, and that's great. But character is who you said you would be. It's what makes you the good dad or the good husband or the good person or the good Christian or the good worker or the good driver. And when you break that character, and we all do, when you break that character, you betray yourself. And that's a big word, betraying yourself. And when you betray yourself, you create a void. And that void has to be filled with something. And most of us in the world will fill it with excuses. Well, they didn't do this. They should have given me this promotion. They didn't do this. I wasn't good enough for this. They should have done this. Boss should have done this. World should have done this. That, but that's, uh, that's very surface level. I'm going to hit you with something, and here's what every one of you fill that void with when you're at your worst. Maybe you're not there now. Maybe you're in a pretty good place. Maybe this is you're hoping to come here and change something over three days that's big, and that's cool. It's a good place to do it. Maybe you're coming here just to get some, some lessons to make yourself better, maybe some fellowship to make yourself stronger. But let me hit you with something 
that I don't have to poll anybody in this room to ask about because when I say these words, you don't have to do it here and everybody's going to avoid not doing it. But everybody I tell this to on my couch drops their head. When you break your character and you betray yourself and you have a void that needs to be filled, you're all feeling it with what I call lesser than. Now that's not the moment. Lesser than is the really nice word for I'm a piece of shit. Right? And I thought, man, that's kind of, I've got to that and that's kind of, that's kind of strong and maybe everybody doesn't think they're a piece of shit. Well, I don't think you walk around the grocery store and drive down the road thinking you're a piece of shit all the time. Maybe you do. We can work on that. But I know that when you're at your worst because you betrayed your character, because you created a void, that now you're a piece of shit. Everybody in my couch drops their head when I say that. And again, I don't think that everybody is that. I hope I'm not that. I don't think so these days. But at your worst, that's where you are. Now, there's one caveat to that. I'm going to come back to this. The caveat to that, I said this was the lesser than. That's the nice professional word for piece of shit. The other side of that is the greater than. I'm greater than everybody else. I'm greater than that idiot and that idiot and that lazy person and that crappy person and that wife and that kid and that coworker, right? Are we, though? Probably not. But when I'm, in, I'm there, I'm there, right? That's my anger. My greater than. One thing I failed to mention that most of you actually know is that my nickname is the Angry Viking Therapist. Doesn't say the polite Viking Therapist. Doesn't seem the moderately upset <laughs> Viking Therapist, right? It's the Angry Viking Therapist. I'm really damn good at anger. I don't know that I've ever been completely depressed. Or I've been depressed. I don't know if I've had depression. I've been anxious. I don't know that I've had anxiety. I've had some PTSD. Uh, I've dealt with that. Uh, but I've damn sure had some anger. I know that guy, right? I've had some guilt, I think. I've had some remorse, some frustrating. Anger, I know. And here's how I know. And this is what led me to kind of understanding how we get to this mindset problem. If you ask me if I have any good memories of law enforcement, and I think about it long enough, I can come up with some cool chases and some stuff that I was in that's kind of fun, stuff that nobody else gets to do. But what I remember first, and especially those first few years, is I remember the last three years of being a police officer sitting in the median in my cruiser, absolutely pissed at the whole world. I hated my coworkers, my bosses, they were all letting me down. I hated civilians, I hated my family because it was falling apart. I hated the financial structure I was in, which was negative in the red. I hated everybody and everything. And I was just begging that somebody would drive by at 120 miles an hour in a stolen car shooting a gun out the window. Because I damn sure knew how to handle that. No emotion. All right? Any of you that's worked high-risk jobs or dealt with high-risk things or been in the military, you know. Combat's scary. Chasing a stolen car and they're shooting a gun at you is scary. No fear doing that. All right? No emotion is why. You just go do it. And you've all had things like that in your life. You didn't have to chase stolen cars or be in military combat. You've all had things in your life where you just got up and handled it. Why? Because my greater than anger was covering my lesser than piece of shit. Right? It was covering it. It took me years to kind of understand that. And everybody's got that lesser than in them somewhere. Maybe it was a day in your life. Maybe it was a week. Maybe it was a month. Maybe it was the last six months. Maybe it's today. Maybe it's the next three years. Maybe it's your whole life. And I thought, man, that, again, that's kind of harsh, you know, but people started responding to it. And this is what also drove it home for me. I thought when I started doing this that I was having to teach a bunch of type A guys why anger was bad, right? Oh, it's ruining your family and, you know, make, it's ruining your health and it's not really doing that good. Now, now, the caveat, of course, is some of us have worked in professions where anger was a little helpful, right? But that's a very special situation. Was anger at my wife, my kids, and the world, and the president, and the economy, and God, right? Was my anger really uh, helping me? Absolutely not. We knew it, but here's how I knew it, and here's how I figured out I was finally willing to talk about it. Is because I thought, man, I have to teach people why anger is bad. Because every now and then I would get that guy to come in, they're like, oh, my wife makes me come in here because I'm angry. They don't last very long. If you don't want to change, I can't help you much. But I don't have to explain to people why anger's bad, it turns out, over the last 10 years. 
And here's why. Yes, it hurts things. Yes, we can kind of pinpoint things, but I kind of liked it. It worked out pretty well for me. Made me feel strong and tough. Made me lift really heavy weights. Made me not give a shit, I thought. But here's the trick with anger. Everybody that ever came in my office and I said, here's what anger does and here's why it's bad. Because when you lose your shit, I know for a fact, for a fact, 15 minutes later, you're sitting on the edge of your bed saying, what the fuck is wrong with me? Fucking did it again. Pissed her off, scared the kids, wrecked the car, ran off, right? Everybody, everybody that's ever come in my office or talked to me online goes, huh, yeah, man, like, not every day, but yeah. That's why I got to get on top of this, right? Now, not everybody has that anger problem, but I guarantee you, you have the lesser than problem, right? Now, here's where therapy gets some of that right. I didn't invent all that. I just put it all together, kind of figured it out. And here's where they go awry again, just like the bringing awareness without a solution. Well, I mean, I know you call yourself a piece of shit, but you know you're not. You got a good family and you make good money and you got a nice car to drive and a roof over your head and you serve in the military and you're a good guy. You're a good guy, right? And eventually they get you kind of convinced like, yeah, okay, all right. Like, yeah, I guess I'm okay. Like, I need to fix some shit, but I'm okay, right? And then you walk out of my office and you got a flat tire on your car. See, I heard it, right? Ah, shit. I went to shit again, right? It doesn't work. That stuff doesn't work. Okay, so how do we fix it? I'm not about just bringing awareness, so how do we fix this? We're not going to be all talk about it. How do we fix this? Well, in my opinion, you have to reverse engineer this. If you don't want to be a piece of shit, stop having the void to fill. If you don't have the void, stop betraying yourself. If you want to stop betraying yourself, keep your fucking character. Do the shit you'd said you'd do. Be the person you said you'd be. Follow the rules that you said you would. Be the dad you said you'd be. Be the husband you said that you'd be. Be the worker that you said you'd be. Be the driver you said you'd be. Be the person that's better with their money that you said you'd be. Be the person that seeks help like you said you would. Be the guy that turns off YouTube once in a while. Sorry, T. <laughs> be the one that turns off YouTube once in a while and goes and works on their family, right? Be the one that stops making excuses. Now, again, I started out this conversation with, I have no business teaching you this because I screw that up on a daily basis. Now, I hope that I screw that up in a very small amount on a daily basis. Things that I admitted earlier that I don't do very well at, right? It's still breaking character. I still have to deal with the negative side of that. It still makes me feel not good enough, right? But it's very small compared to the worthless piece of shit that I was 10 years ago. And that's a pretty good place to be. One of the things that I'm absolutely sick of seeing in this world is online coaches. Oh, thank you. Now, if you're doing a fitness program and there's an expert at it, if you're learning weapons and there's an expert at it, that's cool coaching, right? You pay for that, you get what you pay for, you learn something new. But this world is filled with people who have abs for the first time in their 20 year old life because they have high metabolism and suddenly they're a gym expert and they want to charge you $300 a month <coughs> about, <clears throat> excuse me, how to look like them, right? And then you get in there, and what you realize, because I've fallen victim to these knuckleheads before, what you realize is they're just shitting out the same diet plan they gave everybody else with the macros changed a little bit, and they're copy and pasting a workout plan. I know, because everybody that asked me for a workout plan, I copy and paste it and send it to them, right? Because the shit works. You just got to go to the gym and work and eat right, right? <laughs> it, it works. And yes, if you were a pro bodybuilder, we need to tailor some things for your shoulders and your back and your diet, right? But it just works. That's what they're doing over and over and over again. And I've fallen victim to those knuckleheads. So I got away from them. But then I start seeing now all the life coaches. Life coaches don't need licenses. And there's probably some good ones out there, right? They just aren't a place they can go to school, don't believe in that licensing system. It is kind of a mess, right? It didn't necessarily teach me anything amazing. It's just something I got so I could do this. So there's no, uh, there's no regulation on what it takes to be this awesome life coach who's driving his you know, $100,000 car and can teach you to do the same thing. There's a billion of them out there. 
Uh, I'd go on and on for hours about those guys. But here's the thing with those coaches. Those coaches, what everyone will teach you, they have a common theme. We don't fail in my program. I don't fail. I get up at 5 in the morning every day. I've been doing it for six years. I've not missed one day. Whatever. Right? I've not missed one day. I, I've got this car because, you know, I had to spend the money because I make so much money. Right? And you find out it was leased, you know, <laughs> for three days while they did a photo shoot. Right? <laughs> Those coaches, every one of them, don't fail, don't fail, don't fail, don't fail. Never fail, never fail. Get up every morning, don't fail. Because if you fail, you're a piece of shit, right? So it just breeds into the problem. I've fallen victims of these knuckleheads before. I can tell all kinds of stories. What the hell's wrong with failing? I mean, I don't want to, right? I don't want to screw up. I don't want to fail. I don't want to mess up. What the hell's wrong with failing? I don't think it says in this book that you'll never fail, right? I think there was one of those in the history of the world, right? Never fail. Of course I'm going to fail. That's how I learn. Now, I don't want to fail huge, right? I don't want to lose everything. I don't want to be lazy and fail. I don't want to not do the things I said I was going to do and fail. What the hell's so wrong with failing, right? And the problem is, is that fail now puts you back into breaking your character, which betrays yourself, which creates a void, which makes you a piece of shit, All right? Here we go again. It's not the failing that's a problem. It's the emotional overreaction to failing that's the problem. And I'll tell you, it's the emotional overreaction to everything that you get wrong that's the problem, right? How many times have you screwed up something little and you're a dumb piece of shit, right? I use an analogy I call the stub toe analogy. If you're sneaking through your living room, going to get a snack, wife's asleep on the couch, you know you're going to get in trouble if you're getting a late night snack because you said you wanted to lose weight. She's going to yell at you. So you leave the lights off and you stub your toe on the uh, furniture. It hurts, right? And rationally what that would be is, oh shit, that hurt. I'm such a knucklehead. I probably shouldn't be getting a snack anyway and I stub my toe and I should have turned the lights on. Yeah, okay, that, that sucks. That hurts. How many times have you turned that into, I'm such a dumb piece of shit, I can't do anything except stub my toe. Here's another damn thing on the list of damn things that I can't do right. What kind of stupid dumbass can't make it through his living room and not stub his toe on the furniture that he bought and put there? <laughs> right? It's the emotional overreaction that becomes the problem. It's not the problem itself. And here's another one that puts yourself in that shitty category, which I like to address with people, which also gets both the head nod um, and a little bit of resistance, uh, but then hopefully some growth. Husband after husband after husband or boyfriend after boyfriend comes into my office and says, my wife does this, doesn't do this, does this, doesn't do this, don't know how to fix this, she doesn't do this. I admit there's some things that I could do better, right? But she doesn't do this and doesn't do this. And what I've learned to hit them with is, you know, actually what you're failing of and what you're dealing with right now, you're suffering from the last 10 years of the bullshit you didn't do. Right? And every one of them go, hey, actually I've been, yeah, you're right. Yeah, <laughs> right? Right? And it's just made you shitty, which has fucked your communication, which has ruined your marriage, right? Hopefully not to a point that we can't fix it. We'll fix it, but I can't fix her anyway. We got to work on you, man, <laughs> right? I can give you some ideas to maybe talk to her a little differently. I don't always have that figured out. My wife will remind you. I don't always have that figured out, but I can definitely tell you some ways. But that's all uh, my absolute least favorite phrase in all of mental health other than mindset. My least favorite phrase is coping skills. Holy crap, shoot me in the foot <laughs> if I ever say that and mean it, all right? Because there's coping skills, right? Well, here's what we're gonna do. You get angry all the time. We're gonna give you some coping skills so you can learn to walk away from the fight, you know? So you can take 10 deep breaths, so you can count to, count to 10 or 20. That's your coping skill and everything. You'll learn some skills if you work with me about how to deal with all this problem. Well, bullshit, first of all, because if I'm in the kitchen slamming cabinets, angry at my wife, and she tells me to take 10 deep breaths, I'm going down the hallway, slam the door, probably twice, probably hard enough to watch the uh, doorbell fall off the wall. I know, I've seen me do it, right? <laughs> it doesn't work, I gotta fix the problem. Now, the coping skills are okay, if you're having an anxiety attack or a panic attack, get yourself slowed down. I'm not gonna take them away from that. But your coping skills are not gonna fix your communication problem, your anger. And here's the extra step about you being a piece of shit 
after breaking your character and betraying yourself to creating a void and filling that void with your shit is now everybody that contributed to this problem, which isn't your problem, of course. You didn't create it. Everybody that contributed to this problem is no longer a person. They're an object in your way. How many times have I seen somebody on the road as an object? Okay, well, I can make an argument sometimes, right? But they're not a person. They're a worthless piece of crap who can't drive. And if I don't tell them how bad they drive, they'll never know. <laughs> All while my wife is pulling on my shoulder, you know. Now, I'm not saying I have that one completely figured out. And I'm not telling you that getting yourself in a better place of not being a shit is going to make you enjoy being pulled out in front of. Oh, no. No, no, no. I have a dash cam on my truck for a couple of reasons. One, I don't trust people to tell the truth. Two, I like to put you on Facebook when you fuck up in front of me. I've seen me do it. Uh, and three, uh, it's a, it is an accountability marker for me to not get out of my truck anymore. Because I had a problem with it, right? Now, I'm not saying if somebody cuts in front of me and then I honk at them and they flip me off even though they're the stupid idiot that I don't uh, return in kind or say things I shouldn't or, you know, ride their butt for a little bit. I'm not perfect yet. I told you I wasn't. I just don't get out of the truck anymore. I'm not really proud about this. Hopefully, uh, YouTube doesn't pick up on this when it gets posted. I've left a mini a cor uh, boot prints and corner panels across the state of Kentucky. I'm not real proud of that, but I did. You know, that was just me. But... Although comical, what did I see that person as? Just a fucking object. Fuck them. They're the enemy. It's an object, right? Now, I'm not going to love this person and want to find out about why they can't drive or, gosh, is there, is there a crock pot in the front seat that they don't want to spill? You know, that's, that's my wife. She's much nicer than me, right? But, but so I'm not trying to make them this human being I want to know, but I've made them an object. Okay, well, I can make an argument for that, for somebody that steals from me or cuts in front of me or wrongs me. How many times have you made your wife an object? Don't shake your head, because we all have, right? Maybe it was for 30 seconds or for five minutes or for five years. But I don't call my wife things that I shouldn't call her if I think she's a good human. Here's how I figured that out. I come home from work in patrol, 10 hour long day in the heat, sweating. Can't wait to get this uniform off. She's had the day off because she's a nurse. And I walk in, the sink's full of dishes. All right, big deal, I'll do the dishes. I don't think it's necessarily her job, but I also notice she's on her 30th episode of Say Yes to the Dress. <laughs> or whatever she's watching that day, right? And uh, it goes right through me. So I go and I take off my uniform and I go back and I like to say, of course I did the dishes because I want to see my wife naked again one day. So of course I did the dishes, right? But while I'm doing the dishes, I got some pretty dark thoughts, right? Not only stuff that I wouldn't say to her, but stuff I don't believe. Calling her lazy, no good, I do everything around here, I never get any help that I need, right? And guys will be like, yeah, but I don't say those things. Oh, she knows. She knows, right? Because we know when she's saying it. She knows. And I'd do this a couple times, and it would cause me to be angry. I'm seeing her as an object, right? And then it hits me one day. I would give my life for this woman. I would literally take a bullet for my wife and kids, and I'm calling her a lazy bitch in my head. What kind of worthless asshole am I, right? Now, why did I do it? Because she's an object. I don't think she's lazy. I don't think she's any of those things I was thinking. And they really didn't go that dark. They were just causing me animosity. And animosity is the killer of all relationships, right? Go ahead and don't tell your wife for three years what you're feeling. See how that goes, right? That animosity builds up. You start seeing people as objects. I see the boss as an object. I see my employees as an object. I see my clients as an object. I see traffic as an object. Oh, here's one good for you. I start seeing God as an object, right? I don't mind telling all myself. I always tell people that I'm the only person that I'm the expert of. So I'll tell them my own stories. So the day before I came here, I'm ready to come here. I enjoy speaking and teaching this stuff. I want to hang out with my friends and like-minded people and meet new friends. And it's going really smooth. So I know it's coming. Something's coming, man. So Thursday, or, or Wednesday rather, before I come down, I go wash my truck, make it, vacuum out the inside, make it look nice so I can hit the road. And I notice there's water in the floorboard. 
pasture floorboard of my truck after going through the car wash. It's a fairly new truck though, so I, you know, could be something weird. So I checked the door. Feels like the door, the door frame might be a little wet. So I'm like, all right, maybe the kid screwed up shutting the door or something in the seal. It's just a little bit of water, no big deal. So I vacuum it up, no big deal. And I pull away and the air conditioning's not working now. Well, I don't know if it translates on the camera, but I'm about 260 pounds. And uh, I'm not gonna drive here without air conditioning. I'll drive here without a radio. I'll drive here without some creature comforts. I'm gonna have air conditioning on the way here, right? So uh, I pull to the side of the road. I go around on the pasture side. Uh, the air conditioning is starting to make a weird noise now. So I reach up underneath where the, uh, the pasture side where normally the air intake, the filter is soaking wet. Great, right? Well, not going to Oklahoma, screw this. Long story short, first is it, it, I shut the truck off and turn it back on and it starts working. So all we can think of is maybe some water got in the AC or something. But uh, guess who I cursed out getting back in the truck that my fucking air conditioner didn't work? One my wife, one the car wash, one Dodge. It was the guy that made it, right? And literally I said like, dude, I'm going to a place where I'm going to read and learn about you all weekend. Like, how can you not, how can you do this to me, right? Now, we know we do this because of the things that we read in here as well. But you did it because you just made him an object, right? I broke my character. I betrayed myself. I created a void. Now I'm a shit. But I'm not a shit. I didn't cause this problem. Must be him, right? Now, I quickly directed that anger uh, down instead of up. Told him to piss off. But made it out here. <laughs> so... Let's talk a little bit now. Like we've talked about this kind of series of events that get you to this I'm a shit. And nobody likes to hear it, but we all kind of have to admit it. So what are some things, I talked earlier, that it's not the, the thing that happens, it's the problem, it's your, your reaction. And really your emotional overreaction to the problem. Many of you heard things like Stoic philosophy, that, that it's not what happens to you, it's how you, uh, you know, it's how you think about what happens to you. I like it. I love Stoic philosophy. My left arm is sleeved up in uh, tattoos about Stoic philosophy. But I just can't think bad shit good. It just doesn't work for me. That's cool. There's more to it than that sentence, right? That's just a reminder. But I can't just think myself good. So how do I get to this place where I'm making myself break character, that I'm turning other things into objects, and I'm making myself a shit? Well, it starts because you're making what I like to call irrational demands. And irrational means not based on evidence. It doesn't mean dumb or stupid or made up or can't handle it. You're making irrational demands. And they're irrational demands that you can't make. Demands sound like shall, should, have to, must, absolutely must, should not, cannot, must not, have to, must not. Right? Those are demands. And... You can't make a one of them about the world. Now, let me explain. Here's where we go wrong. We make three demands about the world that always get us in trouble. Every one of your anger outbursts or your depression or your anxiety outbursts all come from these three things. I call them the musts, M-U-S-T-S, the musts, because you're going to hear the three, you're going to hear must in these three things. My first demand is that I must do perfect and other people must recognize it or I'm a worthless piece of shit. Now, I didn't say it's not cool to do things perfectly. Of course I want to do it perfectly, right? I want this to go well. I want my drive to go well. I want other things this week to go well. But to demand, first of all, that it go perfectly sounds kind of dumb. Okay, I can get behind that. But that's not the problem. The problem is I demand it must go perfectly or I'm a worthless shit. Now, again, I don't think I walk around the grocery store thinking I'm a worthless shit because I couldn't find the macaroni and cheese or something, right? I don't assign this to everything in my life, but I do assign it to things in my life. I must do perfect, and other people must recognize it or I'm a worthless shit. This is where anxiety and depression come from. And here's my favorite, anger. You must treat me with the respect that I deserve or you're a worthless shit. This sounds very objectifying, doesn't it? Turning people into objects. Now, I want respect. I'd like respect. If you don't respect me, we're probably not going to talk much more or do business. I don't want to hang out with you. Maybe it'll turn into something bigger. 
But to demand respect, how stupid does that sound, first of all? Any adult knows you can't demand respect, right? We've all worked for people or had people work under us or worked in government. You can't demand respect. Can't happen. It's a ridiculous claim. But that's not the problem. The problem is that you demand respect, and if you don't get the respect that you deserve, they're a worthless shit. That's where anger comes from, right? Now I'm pissed. I see you as an object. You're a worthless piece of crap. That's where anger comes from. And the last one, although it sounds silly, is another one of our big problems. Uh, the world must be easy and carefree. Give me what I deserve when I deserve it, or it's a worthless shit, and I don't want to be here anymore, right? Now, anybody that's been on the planet for five minutes thinks that sounds silly because we all know it ain't going to go the way you want. You're not going to get what you deserve. It's not going to be easy and carefree. Yeah? Then why do you say stupid shit like, this isn't fair. It must not be this way. It can't be like this. This must not happen. You've demanded that it must be easy and carefree and you must get what you deserve when you deserve it or it's a worthless shit and you don't be here anymore. All right? So I've given you two ways to get yourself to worthless shit or to get other people to worthless shit. You break your character, you betray yourself, you create a void and you fill that with I'm a shit which makes other people objects and yourself one, all right? You don't call yourself a shit if you don't think you're just an object and not a person. If your kid came home from trying out for something and didn't make it and they use whatever their term is for I'm a shit, I'm no good, I can't do anything right, nobody will ever talk to me, of course we say, I don't think this makes you a shit right go back to the stub toe analogy if you've decided that this stub toe on your furniture means that you can't do anything right and you're a worthless piece of crap and here's another damn thing on the list of damn things that you can't do right and your spouse wakes up and they're like I, I don't think that's what this means i think this means you stubbed your toe and you should have been getting a midnight snack you dumbass <laughs> right but we've turned ourselves into an object right and i'm there's no better person to curse me out than me absolutely not right I'll stand up if people do it to me, right? But absolutely can do it to myself beyond reason. So I must do perfect or I'm a shit. You must treat me with respect or you're a shit. And the world must be easy and carefree and give me what I deserve or it's a shit. One of my favorite sayings is, is that culture will eat strategy for breakfast, right? Kind of a well-known military term, kind of a, a well-known uh, business term. We always say, you need to have a strategy for this, you need to have a strategy for this, you have a strategy for this. And I'm not gonna pretend to know what it's like to be in special forces of the military, but I can speak for systems of law enforcement. And they probably have lots of systems for what goes wrong. If this goes wrong, we'll do this. If this goes wrong, we'll do this. If this goes wrong, we'll do this. And then they go into battle, or we go to a call in law enforcement, and we don't have a system set up for the shit that actually happened, yeah. right? So how do we get through that? Right? Well, maybe we relied on a couple of systems to put together, but how do we rely on that? We put together a culture. Right? Special forces is a culture. Military is a culture. Infantry is a culture. Law enforcement is a culture. I have to figure out what to do here. Culture will eat systems for breakfast right? or strategies for breakfast. Well, when you are stuck in these three shoulds and you're stuck on that you're a shit because you broke your character, you're creating your own culture. You can put all the systems in place that you want. You can go see a therapist. You can read this book. You can talk to somebody. You can put systems in place that keep you from screwing up. You can block yourself from pornography. You can keep yourself from doing the things you shouldn't be doing. You, should, you can set alarms to get yourself to the gym or whatever, you're, whatever it is that you feel like you need to be doing to keep your character. And as soon as you do that, break your character, create the shit, make demands that you can't make, you're now creating your own culture. Congratulations. You're eight years into screwing yourself up with very simple terms, right? And you put all the systems in place you want, but you're creating your culture. Uh, one of the things I learned today uh, was uh, that there's a, a kind of a, a popular saying among substance abuse, was it if you hang out in a barbershop long enough, eventually you get a haircut? I think that's what I heard. Well, I always said it, if you hang out with cripples, you'll eventually learn to limp, right? Part of this is, is surrounding yourself with the people that you need to surround yourself with. And I don't, I don't care how strong that you think you are, you become the sum of the closest people that you hang out with. Why do you think we watch YouTube of people we like? 
Why do we come to things like this and spend our hard-earned money that could be on something else? Spend our time away from home. It's because you hang out with the right people. You start learning these systems to get out of your own way. And I've been in law enforcement or public safety since I was 17 years old. I took my EMT when I was 17, got an EMS, became a law enforcement 21 as soon as I could. So all I've really ever known is government. I really didn't know the civilian world until I got out. Turns out it's not as cool as I thought it was going to be. But, but I could, so my frame of reference is the things that I've done. So at 21 years old, I graduated the academy, standing tall, standing strong, going out and going to do the right things in the world. Not going to fall into the, the bad that happens in law enforcement. Not going to be that guy. I'm going to work hard. I'm never going to be one of those lazy ones that are hiding behind the lows, watching TV, waiting for a call to go out. Nope, I'm going to go out and get shit done. And I think for the most part, I stayed fairly true to that to the last few years. But when I look at those last few years, I think, would that 21-year-old academy graduate be proud of what I became 18 years later? Nope, absolutely not, right? Would the kid that, uh, what do you say, that you have a very short time, 18 years, right? Very short window to raise your kids, to have influence on your kids. When you got them to 18 and they're doing pretty good and they've been out of the house for 20 years, would they be proud of the person that you are now? Now, things change, right? I'm not 21 anymore. I don't do that job anymore. My ideals are different about the world. My understanding about the, different is, uh, about the world is different right? So I'm not saying that I need to go back to be that 21 year old standing tall guy again. But if my academy graduate me wouldn't be proud of where I am today, guess what I just created? A breaking character, a betrayal of myself, a void that I feel with, I'm a shit, right? I have to stop engaging in mediocrity. We're really good at it here in the U.S., you know? I haven't been a lot of places outside of the country. I know some people in this room have been a lot of places outside of the country and uh, know how easy we have it here. And that doesn't mean I think you have to like be able to chop wood every day or you know, do, do 100% physical, your, your physical limit every day. But my engaging in mediocrity is another way that I break my character. I know the shit that I'm supposed to do, and when I don't do it and I engage in mediocrity, I've now broken my character, which betrays myself, which creates a void, which I fill with, here I go again, a stupid piece of shit, right? The other part is, is talking about doing something and thinking about doing something vie for the same energy, so act accordingly. Right? Thinking about it and doing it take the same amount of brain space. So maybe you, should, uh, maybe you should move that around accordingly. Maybe you should uh, use your, your power reserves accordingly. Talking about something and doing something. And again, th these are bullet points that any coach could tell you at this point. But if you look at this, how all feeds back to breaking your character, you've created your own problem. And what I'm trying to get everybody away from is, well... You know, I just need to learn some coping skills. I need to quit being so hard on myself, right? Uh, I just need to take some deep breaths. You know, if I would just, if we could just move, everything would be okay. If I could just get that job, everything would be okay. No, it won't. You're going to move and get that job, and you're going to be the same shit sandwich that you were before, right? Again, it's the angry Viking therapist, not the mediocrity Viking therapist, right? So I want to throw a couple more things at you. I know it's getting warm in here. I know that we're getting kind of dinner-minded, but I want to throw a couple more things at you. And the trick is, all this adds back to you breaking your character. Every piece of this goes back to that core idea of you breaking your character. Because when I thought about this, and when I started to learn these ideas, I thought, well, I just won't break character. I'll do the things I said I was going to do. I will finish what I said I started. I'll finish the projects. I'll treat my wife fairly. I'll treat other people as best I can. I'll work as hard as I can. I already work 100 hours a week. How am I going to improve on that, right? So there were other things that I started to realize that were screwing up my mindset of what my character should be, which was making me fail in the long run. Mindset is not just thinking myself happy. There's so much more to it. Uh, 
things, think, you know, have to write it down, but if this speaks to you, these are the things that I think add to being able to keep my character. <laughs> Pros work from commitment. Amateurs work from emotion. Which one are you going to be? Again, I, I don't want to spend a whole 20 minutes just sending bullet points at you and one of them makes you feel better. You can get online and read that stuff on Instagram if you want to. But doesn't it make sense that this goes back to building your character? Pros work from commitment. Amateurs work from emotion. You hear things like purpose over pleasure. That's one that's a pretty, pretty common one these days, right? Quit making decisions based on, on pleasure. And here's one of my absolute favorites that I didn't realize fit into this category until I heard it a couple of times. Hey, Doc, I, that's a great speech, man, but I'm extra screwed up in this area. You're not extra screwed up in this area. You're habitually constructing that you're extra screwed up in this area, right? What, what, what's the fix? Keep your fucking character, right? What's the fix? We talk about this. I'm going to show you before I get done a couple of, uh, you know, scriptures that, that talk about this, some of which we covered earlier today. You're not actually screwed up in this area. Do the things that you said you were going to do. Keep the character you're supposed to be. Be the person you said you are going to be, and you won't do it. Your sole job from the moment you wake up from the moment you, to the moment you go to bed is to refuse to break your fucking character. That's your sole job. And if you don't do it, you don't break character, you don't end up a shit. And then tomorrow you don't end up a shit, and the next day you end up a shit. And I choose to stay in character because I'll be an asshole to my wife if I don't. I know that sounds a little extreme, but when I choose to be less of myself, I know I will absolutely outwardly project that I let myself down. How many times have I let my character down and I've taken it out on somebody else? How many times? I've done it today. I can give you an example. I've let myself down. I let something that somebody else said creep in I felt like it broke my character, and then I felt shitty about it. That was me, not them. That was me. You got to get rid of all that vices and all the bullshit that you know you shouldn't be doing, because until then, you're never going to grow your character. You're never going to keep it. Only then will your actions be in line with what you actually desire, and what you desire is your character. This all goes back to keeping your character. Stop breaking character. Is one of my favorites. Stop taking advice from people that aren't in a position that you want to be in. This is a hard life lesson for me when I was trying to build character. Stop taking advice from people who aren't in a position that you want to be in. This doesn't mean ignore everybody that's, that you're better than. I, I might take advice from the salesperson at a retail store. I'm good with that. Maybe they're a good person. But when you build an online uh, presence, as many in this room have do, done, you get the absolute dumbest hiding behind fake name morons show up, right? Uh, and tell you things that I don't care how strong you are, every once in a while we'll get to you a little bit. I'll tell you the funny side of this. Uh, I actually got not just banned, or, or not just uh, suspended, on Instagram for 30 days. I got banned. They took my site completely down. I had, to, I had to appeal to get it back with a marketing person. Because what I would do, although fun at the time, was uh, somebody would call me a name as they hide behind a, a fake name and no real picture. Somebody would say something against public safety or military that just rubbed me wrong. I don't care that people don't like us. I don't really care their opinion. I don't care most people's opinion. But every now and then, one would get me. I'm human. So here's the fun part. What I would do was I'd screen record on my phone. I'd go to their comment. I'd circle it. I'd tap their name, and then I'd tap video call. So well, screen recording the whole time. I've done this well over 150 times. <laughs> Zero people picked up the phone. <laughs> Zero. I don't know that if it was my appearance or my anger look. And I wasn't going to yell at them, honestly. I don't know exactly know what I would have said, but I wouldn't have yelled at them. It wouldn't have done me any good. You know, I asked them, like, what's your freaking problem? What are you so angry for? What would you do that made you hate the police, you know, or the military? What rock are you hiding under that you wouldn't bother to serve anyway, you know? Uh, probably 150 times not one person ever picked up. 
Well, apparently, according to Instagram, that's bullying. So. <laughs> <laughs> Stop taking advice from people that are in our position that you want to be in. Many of you have heard people speak here, have met other people, have met people through Bear's online channel or somebody else's online channel of people that you want to be like. And of course, I don't know everybody's background that I follow on the internet, and I don't know if they're telling the truth, or I don't know if they're just kind of a, a baby Torah person like me. Or, uh, But I do know that I see people out there that... Uh, that, that I want to follow, and those are the people who I'm going to take advice from. Every one, of us, every one of us does it. I won't be a puppet of somebody that has no idea what they're talking about. And man, if you want to talk about the vast amount of problems that I see in my office every day, of somebody being a freaking puppet, of somebody they wouldn't give a shit about if they met them on the street. I mean, people are losing their mind over social media. I know most in here, we're a little bit older guys, you know, we're not quite as susceptible as maybe our 12-year-old and 16-year-old and 20-year-old kids, but hey, I've screen recorded and circled it and hit video calls, so I'd be, I'd be full of shit if I, if I didn't say. This is the one of the things that, that I think T kind of pushes, maybe not in these exact words, but I think this is your character too. Live the hard way. Do the hard things the hard way, and when life gets hard, it's no big deal. I think the military people can probably tell you this, right? Law enforcement, we can tell you this. We train far further and far harder than it actually tends to be sometimes. And sometimes it goes to shit, and we're glad we did. But I can't tell you how many times we've made this, you know, building entry into uh, three months of planning. And when we got there, the dude walked out the front door and we arrested him, you know. Uh, so do the hard things all the time so when life does get hard. Too many people today want to go the easy route. So when life gets hard, they just piss their pants. It doesn't work out. So I just want to read. Uh, you don't have to go there uh, just because it'll be a little bit different translation. I'm going to jump all over the place. But uh, in good fashion, I'm pretty sure, uh, man, I love you, but I think this is the third year in a row that uh, Kosher Dad has stolen my scriptures. <laughs> all right. So some of this, this character stuff, right, uh, comes from faith. Some of this, I, I don't know that I'm a good character. I think I am. I think I keep my character pretty well. I promise you I screw up every day. I try to screw up on kind of the minor things. Whether that makes me good or better or worse or not, I don't know. But I try to hit it on the minor end these days. I used to screw up a lot. I told you that part of my story is I lost my wife and my kids and my house and my career. And I had some very, very dark years. Right? But I know that... Some things like what I've talked about today and some things that I've learned through you all as well have helped me keep that character. And part of that character does have to be faith. Whether that's faith above, whether that's faith in yourself, that you can do it. Clearly with the scripture, we're going to talk about, you know, faith of those above. So this just comes, and again, you don't have to go there unless you want to because I'm going to jump a lot. But it's Hebrews 11. Faith in action. Now, faith and confidence is what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. But skip a couple of verses. Verse four, by faith, Abel brought God better offerings. Jump again, by faith, Enoch was taken from this life. By faith, Noah, next sentence, or next paragraph, by faith, Abram. And all these people were still living by faith even when they died. They lived by faith when they died. They did not receive the things promised. That makes it hard to live in faith. They did not receive the things promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance, admitting that they were foreigners and strangers on earth. People who say such things show that they're looking for a country of their own. If they've been thinking of the country they had left, they would have the opportunity to return. Instead, they were longing for a better country, a heavenly one. Therefore, God's not ashamed. Cool, thanks. God is not ashamed to be called their God. He's prepared for seeing them. But jump a couple of more uh, paragraphs down. By faith, Joseph. By faith, Moses did this. By faith, Moses did another. By faith, the people passed through the Red Sea. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell down. By faith, the prostitute Rehab. Rehab. 
right? All these people living by faith. Paragraph after paragraph after paragraph. And what more shall I say? Do not have time to talk about all the others. Gideon and Barak, and you can keep going. Hundreds of people that live by faith and ended up with a much better deal in the end, I think. But they didn't have faith because of what they saw in front of them. And I'm very careful to change things uh, or, or to overinterpret things that I might read or see in the text. You have to get in there and find it yourself. But a lot to me about character, as I've already proven over and over and over again in the last hour, that it's the character that causes you your problem. Not the gas pump that didn't work and not the credit cards maxed out. Not that your car's not working or has water in the floorboard, right? Not that somebody cut you off. Not that your boss fired you and didn't keep his word. Not that you had to move for the 15th time, right? It's not it. It's your character. You've decided that those things are bad. You've broken your character. You've decided you're a piece of shit. Or the nice term is lesser than, right? Jump to 12, though, after verse uh, 5. My son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline. Do not lose heart when he rebukes you. Oh, that's heavy, man. I don't know if you remember or not, but now we find that in a proverb as well. We've heard it earlier today. Thank you, Coach Dad. <laughs> right? Endure, endure hardship is discipline. Ugh. Discipline, character. That's what it sounds like to me. Right? You can go all through this book and find people that kept their character. Our heroes in this book, I just listed a ton of them, kept their character. I don't know if they screwed up. I don't know if they cheated on their wife or checked out hot girls at the gym or forgot to wear their ZTs or... Or didn't read enough, right? But at some point, they kept their faith enough to keep their character. We're following these people. Now, I'll be perfectly honest. I hope I don't have to build a giant boat one day. You know? <laughs> I'm going to have to call for some help. Got you, bro. If you need some security, I got you. Or some mental health, right? But will I? I, I hope so. That's my character. Stop breaking character. Your character creates, is betraying yourself, which creates a void, which you fill with, I'm a shit. There's not a person in this room that at some point in their life, or now, or for the last three months, or for the last six years, hasn't felt like a total shit. And you know that's the bottom. I'm going to leave you with one thing, and if you've been in the military around public safety, you've probably heard this before. But it inspires me to kind of push forward. Uh, you've probably heard this fable or this story before. There's a uh, cop down at the bottom of a hole, darkest he's ever been, way down in this hole. And he's screaming for help. And a pastor comes by and says, hey, man, remember the tools I gave you? Pray, which is important, right? Pray, you know, ask for, ask for help, keep your faith. And then he walks on. The dude's like, what the? I'm still in the hole, man. And then a psychiatrist walks by, and he's like, hey, man, I'm in this really dark place at the bottom of this hole. The doctor writes him a script, throws it down in the hole. Right? So just use that, and you'll get better. Right? And then uh, a former uh, senior officer comes by, and he's like, hey, man, you got to help me get out of here. And the senior officer's like, man, remember, remember what I taught you. I've taught you how to do this, how to get out of this hole. And then he leaves. And then another officer strolls by. And this officer's down there yelling for help. And this fourth officer jumps down in the hole with him. And he's like, what the hell are you doing, you stupid moron? Now there's two of us down here. <laughs> but that officer said, chill out, dude. I've been out here before, and I know how to get out of here. You know how to get out of here. All right? And you don't have to go save the world. That's not what that's about. But you've got the book, and you've got the instructors, and you've got the people in your life, and you've got the materials hopefully, that you've gained some from this week to go and fix it. So quit being a shit and go fix it. And that's all I got for you.